Welcome to You in HD, your identity in higher definition with Pastor Eric Miller. Join us in our journey of faith in God by taking an in-depth look into the Bible's authority and sufficiency to guide us in our Christian walk. Discover your identity in Jesus Christ today. How you doing? This is Eric Miller, and this is UNHD. Uh, this is the beginning series of, of confrontations with God. Uh, how we are changed, whether either for the good or for the better, whether we have uh, accept the uh, grace of God and the, and the hand of Jesus Christ to be saved and uh, in Christ's greatest sacrifice for all those who believe in him, or will we reject him and uh, reject all that God has done, and whether we try to live out, live out our idea that we can please God with our own merits and uh, and be able to com com complete the law, which is impossible for man, but it people do reject God, and many, many will reject God. So um, hopefully you guys will learn from this series as much as I have, and as I'm continually learning, I pray that, that, that you receive this and know that uh, I love you very much and that everything that I do, I do for the glory of God and all that Jesus Christ has given me and everything that I learn. I pray that I'm able to give it to you and you can take it and use it in your ministry and in your evangelism. Uh, this is UNHD, uh, Reverend Eric Miller, a uh, member of Facebook.com forward slash UNHD. Uh, you can support the, mini on the, the ministry on the Patreon page, which is Patreon uh, forward slash, I'm mean, sorry, Patreon.com forward slash UNHD. And uh, of course, our YouTube channel, very small, it just re it's a, a reproduction of the episodes coming from Spreaker.com, but uh, I'm working on trying to get some unique things up there. Uh, but right now, the Facebook page is uh, where um, I'm keeping a lot of uh, personal diaries and things like that on videos. Uh, but anyway, uh, take a listen. I love you very much. In Jesus' precious name, bless all of y'all. Amen. All the life that you see people doing, right? You see people um, talking about... You know, I know I'm saved. I'm going here. I know I'm this. I know I'm. I'm God. I, I know God. And, you know, and, you know, not. I know God five ways from Sunday. You know, I, okay, I get it. Do you think you're going to heaven? Some people say, yeah, of course I do. And I'm going. That's what the next question is. How do you know? Because I'm a good person. Well, that is not true. First thing people are going to do is what? They're going to argue that point, right? Of course they are. I know I'm a good person. How do you know you're a good person? Because I do good deeds, okay? That's, keep that in mind. Do good deeds, all right? But watch this. Look what God, so what does God say about are you a good person? Well, let's go to Romans chapter 3. Uh, there's verse, look at verse 11. Oh, sorry, there's, look at verse 10. As it is written, this is going to sound different because I'm reading from the NAS. As it is, as it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. Did God leave you out of that situation when somebody says, oh, I do good deeds? Yeah, he did. That means them deeds meant what? Nothing. Look what, look what he keeps saying. All have turned aside together. They have become useless. There is none, watch this important fact, who does good. There is not even one of them. How does that feel? How does does that does that answer a question that that might make you uncomfortable? That's pretty. I mean, how 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 direct is God on that situation? Nobody's done good. Nope, not a one. So what does that say about you? How, how do you feel about that? How does, how does anybody take that kind of impact? First they said, what? I know I do good deeds, so I know I'm going to heaven. God says, you know what? No, you're not. You've done no good in your life. Why do you say that? How do you know? Verse 12 again, because you become useless. You have turned away from me. How do you turn away from him? By sinning. How do you sin knowingly against God? Well, guess what you do? You deny him. You start making up your own ideology. And here's the thing. You really think you can earn your way to heaven like God has, has to accept you 
because you did some good work. And, here, and I ask people, they put people in, let's put it to them in plain English. If someone came knocking on your door right now, and you open that door, and it's, it's some lady, hey, you know, how you doing? I got all my bags and my three children were coming to move in. Are you going to let them in your house? Yes or no? You're going to let total strangers in your home. So how do you think God feels? No, he ain't letting you in his house either. I don't know you. But God, you made me. And you've made yourself. By your sins, I don't know you. That's like buying a new car and rolling off the lot and then making the dealership pay for your stuff. They don't have... Guess what? Well, it's limited warranty. Okay, let, let's let's assume that that, the, that theory with God, right? You have a limited warranty to break uh, something breaks down that they broke, right? You can take it back, get it repaired. Here's the problem with God: He made you perfect. You broke it. So if you broke your car and you took it back to the dealership, would they fix it if you paid them? Right? They wouldn't do it on. They wouldn't do it for free, would they? That was, in that sense, that's what the sacrifices were in the Old Testament. That innocent blood was the was was basically the dealership saying, "Okay, if you do this, I'll do this for you. This is what it's going to cost, and you pay it, right?" And let's say it was like eight thousand dollars, you know, or twelve thousand. It doesn't matter. Twelve thousand dollars to fix your car. Let's say twelve thousand. If you make $180,000 a year, are you hurting for that that money? That's a drop in the bucket, right? So what? So the next time your car gets into a wreck, what are you going to do? Oh, whatever. Just take it to the dealership, get it fixed. Right? No big deal. They do professional work. It's perfect, right? No big deal, right? What about somebody that is on our income, $26,000 a year, and we break our car. Can we afford to fix it? Here's the problem. Here's, the, here's where God fits on both. Those that are sitting there abusing they, that their cars and destroying their cars and not caring how to take care of their cars are equal to him to those who are trying to do everything they can carefully to try to take care of their cars, and the car still breaks down. The car breaks down because it's still created by human beings, which is what? Makes imperfect things. Man can't make anything that doesn't break. It just doesn't work. It's going to wear down. It's going to destroy itself. Why? Because we are workers of iniquity. We build sin, build sin into things that didn't have it before. Man made a car. Man made a potential that's going to break one day soon. That's simple. Oh, they could make a car to run on for a thousand million miles. Sure they could. It's going to break. It's not going to do what it says it's going to do. There is no perfect design in anything that was made by man's hand, is it? No. When we made children, children will have what? Inborn diseases. They're genetic diseases. You're passing them down. Genetic traits, hair loss, hair, you know, grain hair, loss of eyesight. Everything we touch is what? Diseased. If it didn't have it, when we created it, it got it now. It's now got that imperfection, that inbuilt destruction that is laid upon our hearts. Watch verse 13. Their throat is an open grave with their tongues. They keep deceiving. Their poison of ass is under their lips. Literally, every time we open our mouths, something ugly and destructive and all-consuming and all-destroying is coming out. Every time somebody wants to come up with their own philosophy, it's killing people. Every time somebody wants to come up with their own ideology, it's killing people. Every time you say to yourself, I'm better than I know, than everybody else thinks I am, you're deceiving yourself. You're lying to yourself because you're telling yourself you're good and you're not. How do you know? You're saying you're good. God just told you you're not. He says not a soul on this earth is. Not born or past. None. Past, present, future, none. You're telling me there's not one good person God has made on this earth. 
Well, let's begin. What happened in the Garden of Eden? It was perfect. And then it broke. And from that point forward, what happened? It's been a long list of destruction, right? That means from Adam, sin is imparted to every single human soul ever existing. Imagine that. Man has only one ability is to create death. This is that hard reality nobody wants to talk about. When a man mates with a woman, he is imparting and transferring death when a child is born and made I'm sorry, when a child is made and then born. He is transferred Adam's sin is transferred from where? From man to woman. Since her flesh is also sin, guess what? Merging of sins. Well, what if we're married? The flesh is still sinful. The soul is still well. The soul is the soul is still sinful in the sense that it under, it only knows sin. But if you're in Christ, you're no longer a sinner, though you still commit sins. You know why? Because the flesh is weak, and your mindset was poisoned from birth. Literally from birth, the very thoughts that you were ever going to have that's destructive was born in you. You never have to teach a child to steal. It learns to do that on its own. You never teach a child how you know to, to not lie. You have to teach well you have to teach your kid not to lie because their inclination is to lie. You have to teach your kid good deeds because intentionally guess what? They don't want to do good. Think about can you can you can you, think, can you grasp that concept like really grasp this concept that I'm trying I'm trying to trying to tell you what the Bible's been teaching. It's been preaching this whole time. You are incapable of doing any good whatsoever. The best you can do is bad good. Or good bad. Depends how you look at it. Or the good way to do it. Hey, great idea, bad application. Or you have the right idea, which one a bad way about doing it. Or you say I had a good idea and it ended badly. You didn't foresee why. How many times that happened to people? I'm like, man, I didn't do anything wrong. Why is this happening to me? Sin of man. Bad things happen to good people. Bad things happen to bad people. Sin is in, sin has no prejudice. It doesn't care about age, gender, uh, ethnicity, denomination, non-believer, believer. It doesn't care. And it's forever hungry and it's never satisfied. That's just scary. Here's another thing. God cannot tolerate sin. God cannot tolerate sin. He can't be around it. He can't be near it. He don't want to be near it. He has no desire to be next to it. And he can't exist next to it without it to be completely obliterated. If God drew you into his presence, as a sinner, you would be obliterated. Think about that. The glory of God, his holiness, is so great. His righteousness is so great, you can't even stand in his presence without being obliterated. That means it's a clean room, right? Nothing can be in there. Nothing. No germ, no complete and guess what? He's in he is completely intolerant of it. When you're holy and righteous and you're right and all your thoughts are pure, all your thoughts are just, all your thoughts are holy. Would you tolerate anything next to you that's even short of that? No. He's not even capable of even accepting it. It is completely not, he didn't make it. It's not his. It's not part of his character. So with that being said, could, could Jesus Christ actually sin? No. Why? Not part of his character, not part of his nature. Well, wait a minute. Wasn't, he, wasn't she born from flesh, Eric? That's what the Bible says, right? The immaculate, immaculate birth, right? Ain't that true? That's what the Bible says. And hey, Mary is a sinner. 
But there's something God did for her. He imparted righteousness on her. Purified her for this one role. And then the Holy Spirit endowed her with birth, right? Which means, guess what? The sin of Adam did not penetrate, did it? Nope. Couldn't be passed down. So you would have to say, here's that, 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 horrible, that horrible fact that for procreation to begin, man must first do what he does with his, you know, with his, with his, you know, reproductive organ to her reproductive system. His reproductive organ only can disperse sin. Her reproductive organ can only birth sin. So God had to remedy both. How did he do that? By making a perfect birth that was not given by Adam. Thank God, right? From that, he had to pronounce her righteous so that she wouldn't birth something sinful into this world. That's why he had to impart righteousness to her. You see, when you look at the scriptures from this point and understand God's true holiness, it makes more sense. Because up to this point, nobody really teaches stuff like that except those who are in sound doctrine, the men that I've learned from. Men who have to understand the holiness of God before you can even move anywhere. If you say, hey, what was the experience that you had when you, was in, when you was in Colorado when you found God? Well, hold on, I didn't find God, to be honest with you, because I didn't know what to look for. He found me, and guess what? I was, I was there all the time, but I was so wrapped up in my own brokenness that I couldn't see him, I couldn't hear him, I couldn't, I couldn't do anything. And guess what? Can you imagine this? You crying out to God, screaming out to God for help and mercy, and because of your sin, he can't hear you? How serious is sin on that one? You would say, well, God is merciful, right? He's going to hear me. Watch this. Again, he's holy, right? He's just, right? Okay. Isaiah 59. Behold, the Lord's hand is not so short that it cannot save, nor is his ear so dull that it cannot hear. Watch this. But your iniquities have made him a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he does not hear you. That's separation from God. When you say, well, that man did some evil stuff, how come you didn't, why do you think God didn't convict him? He ain't hearing that man. That man don't hear him. That's a void. That's a hole. And that hole every human being has. And you know what happens when you blow through a hole? What's happening? You hear an echo, right? At the bottom of that void is what? Nothingness. And that terrifies everybody. Because what's the big terrif terrif ter the horror that people have? Of death. Because they don't know what happens. They don't know what happens after. And that frightens every human being ever born. That's why you think people try to take death by the horns and I'm going to be a, a skier and I'm going to, I'm going to death defy or I'm going to make a religion where I feel better about when I die and transition and every false religion tries to answer that one important question. Where do you go when you die? God has been saying that since day one. Well, not really day one, you know, after everything was built. He already pronounced it. It's already simple. Judgment, death, hell awaits. And this world does what? Then I read it to you. All have turned away from one to know that truth. So what they do? They turned away from it, and they want to talk what? They want to talk their own junk, right? He told you the truth, and what are we accepting? Lies, right? Ain't that true? We're accepting nothing but lies, right? So your whole life, life of a person before that, person before that, person before that, everybody that you know up to this point has been lying and deceiving each other. All God will accept you in because you're a great person. What did God say? You ain't any good. You don't have the capability of being good. You did, but it's broken. It's gone. Well, it's not my fault. Yes, it is your fault. Because as a child, you do choose sin. You are inclined toward it. It's not my fault. Adam did it. It is your fault. You represent the same core as Adam does. And guess what? Every day you make them choices, you have an option. 
confront yourself in your own what to know that you're sinning against God or what? Justify yourself, right? Eventually you're gonna do what? You're gonna justify yourself. You're gonna start saying, you know, if I steal this or I do this, you know, typically I'm a good person. I just make bad choices once in a while. If you make one bad choice, if you lied once, does that make you a liar? Yeah. Right? Can't change that concept, can you? Nope. God thinks in those absolutes, and that scares people, and it makes people angry with him because he thinks in absolutes. From that being said, the fact that God thinks in absolutes, that should confront people why people don't why why you can't really find it. Because why would you look for the very person, the very spirit, the very man who's telling you you are a sinner? You'd be terrified to go try to find him. What hope do you have? The hope is in Christ. The one person you re nobody really wants to even listen to. Think about it. People hate Jesus Christ for what reason? I mean, really look at it. I hate Christ because he gives me a life with God. That's why people hate Christ? Yes. That ain't good, is it? Is it good or no? So that means he died on the cross for what? Nothing. He didn't do any wrong. He died on the cross because God told him to. A lot of people, a lot of people will say, Christ died on the cross for me. Yeah, in the, in the, in the byproduct of what, what has happened at the cross, yes. But he died because he was obedient to God. He died because he was obedient. Because God wanted his children back. And his children could not come back on their own. There is no works, there's no ability, there's no strength that you have in yourself to do anything to right yourself. Man cannot save himself. You know that? So, where does it come from? Where do people get this idea? Where do people get that idea from? You know, oh, I can do it myself. Because people still want to trust themselves. But look at what Job said. Look at what Christ, uh, Christ look what God told you, confronted Job in verse 40. I'm oh, oh, sorry. Uh, Job chapter 40, verse 14. I love this one. Job 40, 14. Uh, this, just, just listen. This is this is this is God talking to Job, right? This is when God is confronting Job after Job has been through chapter after chapter saying that he's a wretched soul, he is no good, he is just a the 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 skin on bad chicken. I mean, Job basically threw himself under the bus all the time and kept saying, "I must have offended God. I have been wrong by God." I deserve what God has done for me. I mean, has done to me and I am at fault for all of it. Now, it sounds pretty Noble that he's basically saying that he screwed up with God, right? But very beginning before all this stuff started, God said to, to Satan, "Hey, just Job, he's a righteous man." Did God say, "Yeah, just Job, he's about as rotten as they come"? No. He says, "Hey, Job is right. He does what's right in front of my eyes." So what did God do? He's gonna test Job's faith, right? And much like every man, what happens? Sin took him. Sin took him. He started to what? Doubt. Start to doubt. But watch this. Then God, then Job, then 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 God confronted Job and basically saying, "Look, I, okay, time out. The pity party's over. Who are you to tell me that I did this to you because of some reason you believe? When do you tell me who I am?" Now, now you think about that. When when God tells you to, who do you think you're talking to? That's kind of it's time to shut up now. You have now crossed the line, and now Job is backpedaling. Watch, watch what he says. I love this part. He starts backpedaling. Watch, watch God, watch God break 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 the entire staff. Okay, so. 
Um, it's probably one of my favorite lines to read. I just I love this scripture. <laughs> I, I like li- it's not funny, but it's like you know when God confronts you and tells you, "Look, man, you better get it together." I'm about to we're about to have some words. Uh, so let's go ahead and take a look. Uh, let's look at yeah, here we go. So where we at? Job, Job where? Job forty, right? Yeah, Job forty. Sorry, I lost I lost train of thought. All right, Job forty. So watch this. So then the Lord said to Job, will the fault finder contend with the Almighty? Let him who reproves God answer it. Uh Uh-oh. Can you imagine that conversation? For the person that finds faults, are you telling me, me as God, you find fault in me? I messed up? Then Job, watch this, then Job answered the Lord and said, behold, now watch Job, he's backpedaling, I'm insignificant, what can I reply to you? I lay my hand on my mouth, once I have spoken, I will not answer, even twice, I will add nothing more. Now, what do you think that sounds, that sounds pretty meager, that sounds pretty humble, right? But God asked the question, didn't he? He says what in verse 2? Will the fault fighter contend with Almighty God? What did Job just say? I'm insignificant. I laid my hand on my mouth. Even if you ask me twice, I'm not going to answer you. I'm too afraid of you. I'm insignificant. Hey, does that mean God what? See, a normal man would what? All right then. Yes, right. No, not God, because God was what? He wants his answer, right? Watch this. Then the Lord said, out of a storm. Now, does that, do you ever had a, a, like a thunderstorm, like a, a, you know, when thunder rocks your entire house? Imagine God saying and answer this in a thunderstorm. Now, gird up your loins like a man. I will ask you and you will talk to me. Can you imagine Job right now? I bet you his knees are knocking like a, like, like he's beating on bongos. Because now you got God's full undivided attention in a, in, a, in, a, in a way that you don't want to have it. So, will you, allow, will, you, will you really annul my judgment? Will you condemn me that you may be justified? Or do you have an arm like God and can you, and, and can you thunder with voice like his? Adorn yourself with eminence and dignity and clothe yourself with honor and majesty. Pour out the overflowings of your anger and look on everyone who is proud and make him low. Look on everyone who is proud and humble him and tread down the wicked where they stand. Look at verse 14. Then I'll confess to you that your own right hand can save you. Since human beings can't do any of those things that God just said, right? Can we save ourselves? No. God just confronted Job in his whole process. Now, Job's not trying to talk about salvation, but he's, trying, he's basically trying, he contended himself to say his complaints were so much, he basically almost validated himself that he was judged by God. Like God needs you to validate his judgment. I know God cursed me. Are you, wait a minute, you're telling me you know something I don't? Think about that for a second. I mean, you tell, tell God his business. Hey, God, I know you want to do my life right, so I'll tell you what. Go ahead and give me this and give me that, and I'm going to declare decree it, and you're going to do this for me, and then we'll be good to go. I'd be terrified to say any of those things. Can you imagine him looking at Eric if you lost your ever-loving mind? Who, who are you to talk to me like I'm your equal? You know what I'm saying? Think about that. God, I'm going to decree and declare you're going to do these great things in my life. Who are you again? I'm sorry, I'm, you're talking to me like somehow you had to say so in the fact that I made you. That I have brought you life and allow you to breathe daily under my grace and mercy and you have the audacity to tell me you got this, you can do your life. Well, guess what? The good news is you have did your life and you destroyed it. But now you're going to demand me, what, that I'm wrong for allowing you to destroy your life. 
And now you're going to basically come find me, and then you're going to stick your hand out. That's why I hate that little that little picture where you see a man reaching out the water, and Christ is reaching out to him. No, that's not how that works. We're literally drowning and, and dead. Okay, we drowned and died, and Christ reached into the ocean, pulled us out, and resuscitated us. That's how that situation happened. That means of no effort of ours. That means we've contributed nothing. Does that sound fun? Well, let's look at it. The, Eric, is that true? You're telling me that I contributed nothing to my salvation. Well, let's take a look. What does the word of God say, right? Is there any idea that we have an idea what God says about the situation? Well, absolutely we do. We're going to go to Ephesians chapter 2. I've been confronting this with people all day today or yesterday. Look at verse 2. I mean, verse 1. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you were formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, Satan, and the spirit of that is now working in the sons of disobedience. That's the devil. You, Bishop, you literally have been walking with the devil. You've been walking with his thoughts, his means. His, his his dealings, you walk in his circles, you talk his language, you deal with his food, you deal with his housing, his housing, his social networks. You're all in and bought in to him. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh. Now this, this is Paul talking about those who were now out, pulled out of that world. Among them, we too formerly lived in the lust of our flesh. Former homosexuals, former adulterers, former, formal, formerly rapists, former pedophiles, formerly liars, cheats, con artists, murderers. Formerly, that's all we used to be part of that. Indulging the desires of the flesh and the mind and were by nature, by our very nature, we were children of wrath even as the rest. We deserve nothing better than anybody else that followed the, Lord, followed the devil because we all followed suit with him. We all was part of his world. We all part of his life. We all did all his bidding, knowingly, knowingly and unknowingly. We served everything that Satan had to offer. We were drinking that thing up. We were eating that thing up and we were loving it and posting selfies about it. Until, watch what this. But God, verse 4, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, remember I was talking about we don't contribute at all, do we? we? I'm reaching out the water to grab Christ. No, you're dead. You drowned and died. He reached into the deep ocean, pulled you out. Even when we were dead in our transgressions, well, how, how do we know that, Eric? Look at verse 5. It keeps speaking. Made us alive together with Christ by grace. You've been saved. And raised up with him, he seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that the age is that in this age is to come, that he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you've been saved through faith and not of yourselves. Look at verse, uh, 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 not verse of yourselves. It is a gift of God. Verse 9. Not as a result of your works, so that no one may boast. Is that is that is that a, that's a confrontation with God? That is how people are confronted with God. I had a conversation tonight with several people, several atheists, several people that the haters of Christ, several people that believe the law still can save them. I mean, you'd be surprised the kind of conversation I have daily. It, it'll blow your mind. The people that truly still believe by some manner of works, some manner of their own human ability, had a hand in their salvation. And the truth is, you contributed nothing. You didn't contribute God being weighed into your favor. You did nothing by your birth because he leaned over and said, you know, so Eric did this, this, that, I'm going to choose him. It wasn't because of any other reason besides God's grace and mercy. It is literally... If you see a rock on the water, you see two rocks on the water, and you choose to pick up one rock and take it with you and put it in your pocket, it is that simple. Why would you choose that rock? God made the same decision. I choose who I have mercy on. 
That rock didn't do anything different than that water. Did it? It was sitting next to another rock. What made it different? You chose it. For whatever reason you chose it, maybe it had a nice curve. Maybe it was blue. Doesn't matter. At the end of the day, you chose it over the other rock and left the other rock there and took the other rock with you. It is no different with God. He makes his own choices based on his good pleasure. So then goes back to, well, Eric, if he chooses us, right? Here's the, here's the obvious question that always pops up. Well, if he chooses us, do we really have a choice? Why does it even matter if he chooses us and leaves us to die? So if he chooses me and leaves you, then that other, then you are pretty much, you know, you don't have any hope. Right? Doesn't that make sense? Since you don't have any say so in it, and it's totally God, then that means spreading the gospel doesn't do anything. Because if God doesn't choose that man, it doesn't work. But watch what the Lord says in John 6. Is it a contradiction? Nope. Watch this. So in John, sorry, not John, uh, John chapter 10, I'm sorry. John 10. I love this. So, look at verse 16. I have other sheep, which are not of this fold. I must bring them also. And they will hear my voice, and they will become one flock with one shepherd. Here's the part, and then it goes back to verse 6, where it talks about that only a man, only God can lead a man to Christ, and Christ can lead a man to God. Okay? That's simple. So it goes back to, let's talk about that rock that got left behind. Here's the point, that, here's the part that's interesting. Okay? Since God is the one that chose that first rock in the first place, and left the other rock behind. That rock that got chosen has no idea if it was the rock in the water or was a rock that got pulled out of the water and walked off with God. The only way you're going to know is if you start drying off. When you start hearing God and feeling him wiping you dry, that's the only way you're going to know. That means... He has chosen those out of the world. And the only person, the only reason we're going to know that that person has been chosen is if when we reach out to them at, at, the, at the point of understanding, I'm talking about at the confrontation point, the woman at the well, when that woman, or let's just, you can say a man at the well if you wanted to, meets God, that confrontation is two things going to happen. Rejection or acceptance. One where it doesn't matter which they well it does matter which hopefully they choose the right correction. But here's the thing: once you meet God, you're forever changed. I talked to a, 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 a man tonight. There's a staunch a staunch atheist. I have a conversation. I'm, I, I decide. I think I'm going to post what I, I I wrote, but I'm not posting what he wrote because that's private to a point. So it was very simple. I made a very very same point. I'm telling you today. No one meets God, and He confronts you in your sins, and you're not changed. Those that have accepted God, that, it, that, that he's confronted them in their sins, have, re, have repented, have fell to their knees. They've said everything to everybody else that ever met God in their entire existence in the, in the Bible. They fell to their knees and say, I am not worthy for you to be in my presence. They, that glory of God, that, that holiness of God, drives people to their knees. The opposite is driven to their knees in anger, rejection, hatred. How do we know that? Because God reveals himself to everyone. All flesh. Every single person ever alive God has revealed himself to. How do we know that? How, how do we know that? You go to Romans chapter 1, verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and, and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Why? How do you know that? Because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God has made it evident to them. So what can, what can man do? Can man say they're ignorant? Nope. Not a soul on this earth can say they don't know God. Not a soul on this earth can't say they don't know God because he revealed himself to each and every soul ever. He was the one that was there when they were created. How would he miss? Like he did, he did, you didn't pass by the conveyor belt and he missed. 
He knew who you were. Knew you by name. That confrontation, everybody's going everybody's to get that day. And the choice is you'll be changed profoundly for the good, for the worse. So is that a real choice, Eric? If God chose me for salvation, then you know, how do I know I didn't make a choice? Here's a, here's a, here, it goes back to the issue with the rocks. You'll know by either by only one one way. When you start feeling him dry you off, it's the only way you're going to know. You have just listened to You in HD, Your Identity in Jesus Christ with Pastor Eric Miller. This ministry is made possible by your thoughtful prayers and donations. Join us each week as we continue to explore our Christian identity in Jesus Christ. May God richly bless you. In Jesus' name, amen.